on this question on World Age Day, well, the things that were developed here and in the community around St. Paul's Hospital, things that were developed are recognized around the world, have been adopted around the world. They started here in this institution. And I think one of the, one of the extraordinary things we can say about it is, and about St. Paul's, is its willingness to help people without moral judgment. That is exceptional in these times. And uh, in the times of the last number of years, and we need, as we're building a new St. Paul's, I was just down meeting the people who are building the new St. Paul's, we need to move to a world-class 21st century building, but the heart has to go with it, and the talent has to go with it, and the focus on the community around. The community will slightly change as we move a sense from the West End to the downtown East Side. That's not such a bad thing in a certain way. Still serve this community. But what happened here was a community of activity and dedicated work of community organizations and community activists. And then, of course, there's the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS and Dr. Montagna and his work. And it'll be reflected. He's going to give you an update on the science. Um, you know, he's better talking about the numbers than me, although I like talking about the numbers. But, uh, but I think the truth is we have to continue this idea that when, you're, when we're dealing with issues, whether it by the work, the groundbreaking work that's happening at this hospital on mental health and addictions care, this idea of treating the whole person of providing world-class science, but treating the whole person and involving the whole community has to be part of our response. The lessons are not just technical and scientific. They're the way we deal with problems as a community. I'm really proud of the work that's happened over decades in BC on HIV AIDS. I'm very proud of Dr. Montagna and his work of St. Paul's Hospital and its work. I've never been more proud of it than I am today. Never been more proud of the work we're doing with Providence Healthcare than today and these days. Because when you reflect back on what you've done and what we've done, it's exceptional. And we have more to do. It is unacceptable when we can do this at low cost here in British Columbia, relatively low cost in terms of healthcare, that there are Canadian provinces that aren't doing it. There are Canadian provinces that aren't doing it. We just had a media conference and people asked about places around the world. And one thinks of, uh, of Johannesburg or Nairobi or, uh, or Ouagadougou or other places around the world and say, how do you provide treatment here? There are Canadian provinces that could do low cost treatment on HIV AIDS that are not doing it today. And so our work continues and it's why what happens here continues to be important. And here in BC, we've got to continue to press. We need community groups to continue to press us to do better, and we will do better because of that work together. It's not about resting on our laurels. It's about building a world community on this World AIDS Day to fight HIV AIDS everywhere. And so it's my honor to introduce, um, to talk about an update on what, how we're doing here and what we're doing in the world, to, inter to introduce Dr. Julio Montagna. Thank you, Mister. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, be with you in your presence, and today in particular, because a lot of the work that we are going to report here today uh, has come together because of your leadership, your support, and your commitment to the work of uh, both St. Paul's, the Center, and the people that we serve, uh, which is the community infected with HIV/AIDS, uh, and not just the community infected with HIV/AIDS, but those at risk and the people that need the help. Uh, to make the best possible decisions to protect their lives. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, my consul, uh, the Argentinian consul, who uh, uh, is also a friend uh, and uh, who kindly agreed to uh, uh, share the, this event with us. And I want to thank my wife for uh, coming and being with us. And of course, to all of you, because uh, um, everything that I'm going to tell you here uh, it represents the 
um, uh, really the, the peak of the achievement that we propose one day. Uh, in fact, as the minister was talking, I was looking at this uh, chart here, uh, and I was uh, re reminding myself, we came up with it together, we can stop HIV AIDS. We stole that from President Obama back in the day, of course. Uh, and uh, and how people made fun of us, say, thinking, oh, come on, you're out of your mind, you're not going to stop anything. Well, I'm here to tell you that we have. And uh, uh, what I'm going to do is briefly uh, tell you a little bit of uh, how we got here uh, through the collective work of the many of you that are here in the room today. Um, I always start with this slide to uh, frame the conversation. Uh, this is where we were at uh, in the early days of the epidemic. Uh, I was a young respiratory trainee uh, and I was asked to look after pneumocystis pneumonia. Uh, we did a lot of work and eventually uh, 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 was able to treat, prevent, and uh, basically eliminate pneumocystis pneumonia at a time in which we didn't think it was possible and yet my patients would go on to die from other causes because there was a virus that was actually undermining their, uh, their immunity. Um, once we figured that out, uh, I gave out uh, uh, on respiratory medicine and I decided to develop antiretroviral therapies. Uh, I took inspiration from the only thing that I know, which is uh, my father's teachings on uh, uh, how to manage and treat tuberculosis. And everything that I did thereafter was to recreate everything that they stopped uh, TV campaigns were supposed to be in, a, in an environment that enabled me to do it better, better, and much better than I ever imagined. And the key, uh, the source that made this possible was political will. And that's why, Minister, we want to thank you for your continued support, because it is because of your commitment that we're able to do what I'm going to show you now. Uh, our first decade of involvement with HIV AIDS uh, uh, in terms of antiretroviral therapy development uh, was focused on the development of combination antiretroviral therapy. And unbeknownst to us, as we were getting together all of the staff to uh, launch the uh, uh, Vancouver International AIDS Conference in 1996, uh, 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 we surprised ourselves when a, a clinical trial that we were doing, a phase 2B clinical trial that was purely exploratory, uh, gave results that we really did not fully comprehend at the time, but we knew it was better than anything we ever saw. And so we went forward and we lobbied the government uh, to actually implement triple therapy in British Columbia. We were the first jurisdiction in the world that implemented triple therapy. And that's why we saw impacts of triple therapy ahead of anybody else. Uh, by the way, I should uh, 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 honor uh, uh, the One World, One Hope uh, famous uh, uh, Paint that uh, Joe Joe says, uh, did for us at the time, which has become the iconic, of course. <laughs> the iconic uh, painting that has become the basically the face of the effort against HIV AIDS around the world. Wherever I go and I put that up, everybody knows who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Joe and I'm talking about Hart. And that's really what changed began to change the course of the epidemic. Our obsessive monitoring of HIV AIDS in this province is what uh, opened our eyes to the fact that the treatment was not just preventing morbidity and mortality, as you see in this slide here, uh, life expectancy growing rapidly, death uh, going down very remarkable, but also at the same time, we figured out that people infected with HIV became less likely to transmit and therefore HIV incidence decreased significantly uh, with the role of antiretroviral therapy at a time in which syphilis was on the rise. Already back then, syphilis was on the rise. And uh, uh, this actually gave us the idea that treatment was selectively preventing the transmission of HIV. And therefore, we proposed that if we were to make treatment freely available uh, without barriers uh, to people that need it, we could actually stop morbidity, stop transmission, and stop the epidemic altogether. I remember vividly when I went to present this in 2006 at the International AIDS Conference at the plenary. Uh, nobody knew what I was going to talk about. I kept it a secret until the last day uh, because I knew it could have devastating consequences if people knew what I was going to say. <laughs> My life was <laughs> on the line. Uh, even the United Nations AIDS program at the time uh, wanted to shut me down because they fear that by making, by medicalizing treatment, which is the words that they use, 
that I was going to be the source of a new epidemic. I forgot to tell you, but they said the same thing when I said ACT, DDI, and Nevirapi could stop people from dying. And, and, and they were saying that, oh, well, those poor people in the south of the world, they will never be able to take these treatments. And by treat, treating them with these complex medications, Julio is going to start a new uh, epidemic of multiple drug resistant virus. That never happened. And of course, female prevention actually was successful as well, as I'll show you in a moment. Before I go there, uh, I'll share with you this paper that in essence showed that when you roll out treatment uh, on a patient-centered basis, you re you re the return on the investment of this intervention is very significant. But unfortunately, uh, every return on the investment of a therapeutic intervention will give you a plateau at a certain level, which is dependent on the age of the population that you're trying to treat. That's a, it's a, it's a built-in economic phenomenon that applies to this kind of analysis. What we did is added to this curve uh, the, the preventive benefit of the intervention. And then what happens is what I call a game changer. Uh, why is a game changer? Because it changes the hysteresis of the curve from a sigmoid shape to an exponential uh, uh, shape. And that exponential shape means that if I am a person living with HIV, the benefit that society accrues economically is limited by my age. But the society at large is also benefiting because I did not transmit HIV during my lifetime. And so that is an exponential return on the investment. We will be all dead, and Minister Dix and, his, and our Minister of Finance will be laughing all the way to the bank because the benefit will continue to accrue as a result of this intervention. And that's the reason why treatment as prevention floats right to the top uh, when you look at uh, competing priorities within the healthcare system. And I'm really glad that the minister knows that, and that's the reason why he's so supportive of our work. It's not just because we're friends. It is because, <laughs> it is because he knows this is the right thing to do. How do we do this? Well, we map the trajectory of individuals throughout the healthcare system uh, from before they are uh, at risk to the time that they probably uh, are sick or dead or whatever, or they are not properly treated. By mapping this epidemiologically, and I, I'm grateful to Bob and Viviani and all of the team that so much uh, uh, effort has gone into characterizing this phenomenon because this is what at the end of the day, we're trying to fix. Uh, you see here a cascade, meaning that you have a number of people at risk for HIV, uh, uh, you have a number of people who are unaware, a number of people who are diagnosed and go on and on and on, and you, you reach this final point, which is the number of people who are biologically suppressed, which is the ultimate goal of antiretroviral therapy. And so we call it a cascade of care because as you can see, it looks like a stair. And so the water flows down, that's your cascade. But we're trying to transform this cascade into a lake. We want this to be flat. Why? Because we want 100% of the people at risk to know uh, their diagnosis and 100% of them to be on treatment and 100% of them to be biologically suppressed. Because if we achieve that, there'll be no more AIDS in the next generation. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, that's not as um, attractive to a lot of uh, my colleagues because see, scientifically, well, like, what the hell? I mean, we're moving on to the next uh, new fancy, shiny drug or whatever. Uh, but this is really what we need to do in order to end the epidemic. It is critical that we optimize the, the deployment of these tools to, so people can actually access them. I used to uh, spend a lot of time with my dad talking about the Stop TV campaigns. And he used to tell me, that the reason why TV campaigns did not work well, at least in Latin America, now I learned that it don't work well anywhere, is because um, when things get better, people lose uh, the, 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 the focus and they look somewhere else. Uh, why? Well, because uh, TV is no longer a problem. And I am always tell people, uh, listen, uh, uh, there is no such a thing as a stable epidemic. Uh, you either kill it or it will kill you. Uh, because as long as there is HIV in the community, uh, it, it's liable to come back. And my father used to tell me, you're right, and you know what? It's even worse. It's economy independent. Uh, the economy goes down, the t TV goes up. Why? Because people take resources away, and therefore we make things worse. So, again, political will, thank you, Minister, is what allows us to continue on this track and make these things happen.
people don't quite realize uh, the fact that we, and this is in the forex and the HIV AIDS, when we talked about our experience, we're not talking like any other clinician in, in whatever clinic elsewhere. We are actually representing the cumulative experience of everybody that has gone through these programs in the province of British Columbia. And these numbers are not trivial. I don't, you can read them by yourself, but let me highlight some of them. Uh, uh, we got uh, 16,000 participants who have access to that drug treatment program since 1982 when the program started, where a total follow-up that is in, in excess of 170,000 patient years of follow-up. And we have every single piece of data on these individuals so that we can build on that experience. We have every genome type, thanks to our brilliant biology lab, Johnson and Sabrina Broom uh, lead that effort, and we're grateful for their commitment to continue to do that work. In addition to that, uh, we have uniquely in this country and probably around the world, a, a, a government-sponsored free exposure prophylaxis program that has now offered this uh, uh, treatment to close to 10,000 individuals uh, with an overall follow-up of 18,000 patients a year. Nobody has this kind of experience. So when we say this works, it's because it works. And when we say we should move on and change things, it's because the data actually directs us in a direction. Let me give you an example of where political will plays a role. PrEP was approved a number of years ago and I spent a lot of time talking to a number of politicians uh, that we needed to do exactly that, add PrEP to treatment of prevention. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it, not because of the money. I couldn't do it because of any technical reason. The problem was that the politicians of the time felt that they could not uh, defend that in front of their constituencies. This is the problem. Uh, and it took one meeting the first time I've ever met Minister Dix, for him to say, yes, we're going to do this. And it is for that reason that I wanted Minister Dix to be today, so I can thank, thank him publicly for his courage and for his leadership to embrace treatment and prevention, plus PrEP, uh, as part of a cardinal contribution to our work on his behalf. So for that, Minister, thank you. And Thank you, Janine, and Rolando, and Mollard, and everybody else that was involved. Because when the minister said, OK, how soon can you do it? I said, next month, we'll start on January 1st. And uh, bingo. Uh, this is what happened when we meet over Christmas. So I'm afraid <laughs> what is going to come out of this meeting this week. Uh, the cumulative enrollees in the PER program are shown here. The active participants are shown here. Uh, this is uh, unlike treatment itself for people infected with HIV. This is something that people avail themselves of depending on their circumstances. Uh, we call it the seasons of love for lack of a better word. Uh, but this is basically what it is. Uh, people uh, uh, need it, they can access it. They don't need it, that's fine. And we work with them to address their needs in that regard. It has been incredibly effective. As the minister indicated earlier on, this is nearly completely effective, if you are highly adherent, in preventing acquisition of HIV, which by itself has had a dramatic impact in our program. I told the minister when we, uh, when we met to do this, minister, this can help us to bring HIV AIDS to its knees in the province of British Columbia, and I'm here to tell you that it did. And this is the most recent data that Viviani uh, generated for us, of course, with a large group of people that collaborate in, in her team, uh, where we look at the key uh, HIV epidemic indicators in British Columbia. Let me first focus on the, on the top figure. Uh, this is the increase uh, in the peak prevalent HIV cases in British Columbia. And what you see here is, is that the epidemic has uh, uh, led to a growth in the number of people that live with HIV in BC. And you could say, whoa, 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 that's a bad thing. Well, no, <laughs> what happens is people stop dying. Uh, and as I often joke, uh, with all due respect, of course, uh, 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 my, the cohort of people infected with HIV in this province uh, had my age, right, Joe? When all this started, and guess what? They have my age now. So we're happy to get all together. And you know what? We're going to die together. And so what? Uh, this is part of the cycle of life. Uh, and and I, of course, uh, you know, uh, 
things vary from place to place, person to person. But the point that I'm trying to make is that this is a good curve. Uh, notice that it's starting to bend over, and more on that uh, eventually in due course. But the reason for that is that because we have less new infections coming in, the people that are uh, living with HIV are basically going on to lead a normal life, and eventually, uh, well, they, they die of old age, and that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> let's look now uh, at the other key indicator that uh, I'm interested. Well, of course, uh, this number of people with retroviral therapy, uh, which as you can see has grown steadily, but uh, 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 pharma today they have to see that this curve is uh, plateauing. Why? Because if this is plateauing, this is going to plateau as well. And Viviani's most recent estimates uh, now suggest that this is beginning to decline and it's likely to decline at approximately a rate of 10% per, per decade uh, in the next uh, foreseeable future, uh, which is part of the proof that uh, investment, investments that we have made in the early days of the epidemic are allowing us to uh, re increase the return of investment that this strategy can, can, can lead to. Importantly, uh, the decrease in estimated HIV incidence has now reached 90% in 2023. Uh, uh, of course, some of this is uh, model. Uh, uh, there has been an 89% decrease in new diagnosis. New diagnosis is a poor surrogate for incidence, but when you look at the actual incidence, it's 90% down. That meets the definition of the United Nations from the end of the epidemic phase of HIV AIDS in a given jurisdiction. So we're here to say HIV AIDS epidemic today is no longer epidemic in British Columbia. So what's the problem? <laughs> so what's the problem? Well, I'll get to that in the next couple of slides. Before that, I wanted to share with you the fact that our treatments are not going to ever abandon those that are living with HIV AIDS because we remain committed to always put them at the center of our efforts because they are the key and, and, and fundamental piece of the puzzle that is going to lead us to a solution. So here you have it, 97% decrease in age related mortality rate since 1994. And this curve is really uh, uh, impressive. This is the, the, it's a piece of art in my opinion. Um, so the impact of female prevention and PrEP in British Columbia can be summarized here. This is modeling work done by Viviani and her team. The impact of PAPs and PrEP on HIV incidence uh, suggest that for each 100 individuals actively on antiretroviral therapy or suppression of antiretroviral therapy, the estimated age of the incidence rate decreased by 2.5%. And for every increase in uh, of 100 people on PrEP, uh, we have a decrease in incidence of 1.7%. Let me remind you, treatment prevents not just transmission, but morbidity, mortality, and transmission in a cost-saving fashion. PrEP is not as cost-saving unless you highly target it, which is what we do in British Columbia, but it is not quite as effective in reducing incidence, but it's essential. And the reason why it's essential will become uh, apparent to you in a couple of minutes. We then assess the relationship between treatment prevention and PrEP on the HIV incidence at the end of 2019 and, and at the end of 2025. And, and, and we, let me just say briefly, because I'm not going to go into all of the details, what we have concluded is that treatment and PrEP are more than additive, and in fact, they're synergistic in their ability to decrease HIV transmission. Uh, we have a paper currently submitted uh, that is uh, describing that in detail. We think that that's going to really rock the boat going forward because a lot of naysayers uh, will not be able to walk away from the combination of TAS and PrEP anymore in the future to come. Changing the, the discussion a little bit, uh, I want to show you further evidence that supports what's going on in the, pre 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 in the province regarding HIV transmission, and specifically uh, to try to tease out uh, uh, how PrEP has uh, contributed to this effort. Um, a number of years ago, uh, uh, many years ago actually, uh, we started doing a genotypic uh, characterization of every single viral strain that comes through the, through the clinics throughout the province. We centralize all of that here. Uh, Chanson and Sabrina are responsible for that program. Uh, the genetic fingerprinting 
of uh, HIV viruses allows us to identify what is the best treatment for you. This is personalized medicine. Uh, people are talking about personalized medicine as a future endeavor. Well, we've been doing it for about 20 years now. One, once we do this, people have now a clear roadmap as to what they need to take to optimize their chances to have 100% success therapeutically. Eventually, uh, we came to understand that we can use this, actually, this information on a sort of secondary basis uh, to identify clusters of HIV transmission. In other words, uh, if I have uh, HIV and I have another person with HIV and uh, we are all HIV infected, say, uh, then I can map your, your viruses and, and, and on the other side, I'm going to decide that my virus matches his virus or her virus or the other virus. Uh, and then there is another cluster here that match. And this is not about to blame anybody. This is not about to criminalize anybody. In fact, we have gone to court to stop the police and the RCMP from using this information because we believe this is essential uh, and needs to be protected uh, so that we can use it for public health purposes. And imagine, if you criminalize that information, then all of a sudden, uh, the whole thing falls apart. So we've been successful a number of times uh, in, in British Columbia courts uh, to do this, and I'm happy to say that the, 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 both the public health officer and the government have been incredibly supportive of us protecting that information. Once we know that, and Jeff is responsible currently for that program, uh, we are able to uh, feed the genotypes into a, a master program uh, and immediately identify uh, a, a cluster emergency, a cluster that, that has become activated. And then we can use that information uh, to target our intervention so that if you're infected with HIV, we can facilitate your access to antiretroviral therapy. But if you are attached to a cluster behaviorally uh, and you are not infected with HIV, then we can offer you counseling and PrEP if that is appropriate for you. And in doing so, we have shown and published this a number of times, uh, we can basically that cool or shut down a cluster of transmission. This is a highly efficient way of, of acting, uh, which is actually critical because as the number of uh, uh, new infections uh, contracts in a particular jurisdiction, that would be the case of uh, British Columbia, uh, uh, throwing services around the provinces willy-nilly is not a very efficient way of doing business. Uh, what we need to do is be highly targeted so we, we, we spend most of our time, energy, and and resources on those that are actually needed and just leave the rest of the, uh, the province alone. Uh, in doing so, uh, we have been able to uh, move this agenda forward. And this is the latest uh, update that Jeff provided for me uh, a matter of days ago, uh, where we look at the proportion of cluster cases, these uh, HIV cases that are shared with clusters. Uh, and you see that uh, while there was a little bit of a tendency maybe to for this to go on, I was very impressed. Until what? Until we got PrEP. Thank you, Minister. We did it together. We now have basically uh, uh, shut down clustered transmission in the province of British Columbia. So, what happens? <laughs> Using a slightly different uh, uh, metric, which is basically the same thing. Uh, here we're, we're talking about per capita cluster cases in each province. We take three provinces. Uh, the top performer in the country, British Columbia, and province B and province C. They are both east from B BC, but I won't tell you who they are because, <laughs> because we're not here to uh, uh, point fingers, but you can figure it out yourself. Uh, and what you have here is a, is a province that uh, basically uh, is not interested in doing anything about it. Uh, and so what happens? Well, it's not a political uh, priority. It's not something that they are pursuing aggressively. So the epidemic is going up, and in fact, the clusters are growing. This is a problem. This is a problem for that province, but it's a problem for this province too, because if they don't fix their uh, act, they, we cannot get rid of our problem. Because currently, today, most of the cases that have been diagnosed in the province of British Columbia are uh, cases that are coming in from elsewhere. A lot of them are coming from the rest of the country, and a lot of them are coming from the rest of the world. So we're here today not just celebrating the fact that we have achieved a significant milestone of uh, ending the epidemic transmission of HIV in this province, ending, virtually ending AIDS premature death, actually to remind the rest of the country and the world that if they don't fix their act, we cannot end it. And so 
Look at what happens when suddenly, finally, uh, Province C uh, started to pay attention. And they decided that they were going to do the right thing, during the prevention, that is. Uh, and uh, uh, Jeff, who is responsible for monitoring uh, these kind of things across the country, uh, uh, under the auspices of the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, was able to demonstrate that in doing so, bingo, it works. So this works everywhere. So I anticipate that uh, the more we talk about this, the more likely it is that people will uh, be encouraged to adopt these strategies so that we can end HIV AIDS uh, globally. I'm incredibly proud and, and, and grateful of the fact that uh, Michel Sinibe, uh, who became the uh, executive director of the United Nations uh, in 2010, uh, immediately recognized the value of the work that we were doing. Uh, we invited him to come over and visit with us. That was in the context of the, the Winter Games, if you remember. And uh, at that time, uh, he formally embraced treatment prevention as the uh, proposal from the United Nations to the rest of the world based on the Vancouver experience. And one day he came back to me and he said, Julio, uh, something's not working here. Uh, I'm going around the world and talking to people about treatment prevention and the work that is being done in Vancouver. And everybody says they're doing exactly the same as you are doing. They got treatment, they got testing, they got this, they got that, uh, but they're getting different results. And, and, and he, you know, being an economist, um, he didn't quite understand what was going on. I said, can you help me uh, to understand what's going on? So came back home uh, from Geneva, uh, and working with Gianni and the rest of the team, uh, we started to model uh, the uh, impact of the HIV epidemic in the province, and then we used that to identify intermediate thresholds of rollout of antiretroviral therapy that would change the epidemiological curve towards a 90% reduction of HIV, AIDS, morbidity, mortality, and transmission by 2030. And we came up with a, a, a very reasonable approach uh, that said that if by 2020, we have 90% of people diagnosed and 90% of them on treatment and 90% of them biologically suppressed, uh, we were going to uh, turn the curve towards uh, the, the desired outcome. Of course, uh, in order for this to work, uh, the subsequent ter target should be upgraded to 95, 95, 95 by 2025, and then eventually, hopefully, we can uh, get as close as possible to the 100, 100, 100. Well, uh, lo and behold, uh, Michel Sidia moved on. I moved on uh, from that role in 2015, uh, but I'm grateful that Antonio Gutierrez, uh, 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 without any further intervention, and despite the fact that uh, globally uh, we were not quite there in terms of the 1990 because of the um, economic crisis in 2008, and and a number of other circumstances, he said, look, let's move on. Uh, we did the best we can. We need to redouble the effort, but 95, 95, 95 will be our next threshold. So today, this is the target for the world. And actually, it has been uh, ratified by every single country around the world. And yet, the results are not exactly what we want them to be. Recently, the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, 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 wrote a... Uh, uh, Report, the 2020 report, uh, basically self congratulatory, congratulatory report uh, uh, saying that Canada was doing a reasonable job at uh, moving towards the 1999 by 2020. And this is uh, the graphic depiction of the data. Um, being the, uh, well, you know, uh, I didn't like it. Uh, this is the threshold that we are trying to reach 1990, British Columbia has surpassed the 1999 by 2020. And then the rest of the provinces, some uh, have done better than others in particular domains, but uh, the reality is that uh, these numbers were not satisfactory to me. So what we decided to do is to um, look at this in a slightly different way. Uh, why? Well, because uh, uh, we know that BC used to have the highest uh, incidence of HIV in the, in the whole of the country back in the day. But through our interventions, collective interventions, we were able to bring it down to the lowest level of all of the large provinces in the country. Uh, uh, but why is that then, that if we can drive the epidemic like that, the rest of the country cannot? Um, and look at this. Um, this is the impact of harm on the epidemic. So the first phase you're all familiar with, and I'm not going to expand on that, but there is no harm effect in the rest of the country. And human prevention actually hits right here, and look at what happens. 
and they did not dream of throwing each other back here, not even here, when the country formally in 2015 and the Justin Trudeau adopted human rights prevention. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is here. Um, when we did the modeling, uh, the modeling suggested a number of uh, uh, rates, uh, but they were kind of difficult to work with. And so uh, in, a moment, in a brilliant moment, so to speak, uh, we decided that from a marketing perspective, because I have to be a marketer as well, uh, they, uh, uh, we could use 9090 uh, to make these more uh, attractive to the community at large and uh, the press and so on and so forth. The actual numbers are more like 9173 if you attach them to the 100 directly as opposed to the previous 90. And, and then what happened is that we decided to redraw uh, the 1990 uh, progress that PHAC had uh, reported. Uh, but you see now the, the true numbers, which is the 9173. It's the same data. We haven't changed anything. It's simply the depiction that has changed. And the reason why that is important is because now the target is shown here, 9173, British Columbia, surpasses all three of them as you expect. And then you start to see a trend happening. Uh, and things don't look so good. Uh, uh, basically, uh, the only province that has surpassed the, the third target is British Columbia, uh, to a significant degree, maybe a little bit of Ontario, maybe a little bit of Quebec, but look at this, the brains are in disaster. Uh, and the only thing that matters is that target. Uh, everything else is basically leading to that target. But if you diagnose 100% and you put 100% of people in treatment, but only 20% of them are virus suppressed, you have done nothing. And, 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 and the problem is that medicine is a little bit like that, uh, and we came around. So, you know, Alberta is a typical example. Uh, they do a very good job uh, identifying people, and then they do a reasonable job of putting people in treatment, uh, although not as good as it should be, uh, but then they, they, you know, they're on their own. So you're not. Uh, that's the problem. And when the, when the minister speaks about patient-centered care, holistic care, what he's saying is that we take shared responsibility for patients' outcomes. We will work with you to facilitate access and continued optimal uh, outcomes related to the treatment. When I go and see my uh, 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 specialist, because I have a, a tear in my meniscus, they say, mm, this is not surgical, bye. And then I want to see the other guy and says, no, 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 you know what, uh, just do some fishing. Uh, and you know what, and nothing works. I spent two years and not being able to walk. I went home, I met the physiotherapist at the front of the family, and he said, give me three sessions on a fiction. And look at this. <laughs> <laughs> That's patient center care. And I came back this morning from my trip to Buenos Aires, and my staff were going, can we bring that guy to work here? Because my back hurt, my tongue hurt, my heart goes, Mister, I have a clue for you. <laughs> So our vision is outlined in this slide. We believe that treatment and prevention is the key to target disease elimination. And we believe that target disease elimination is essential for healthcare sustainability. Everybody is talking about the fact that our healthcare system is in crisis. And everyone, everybody wants more resources, more money, more this, more that. And I told the minister, the last time we met, he said, how much money do you need? I said, none. I said, he said, what's your problem? I said, oh, don't worry. I want to agree with you on the strategy, and then the, you will open the water for me. But the point here, the point here, right, Mr. <laughs> and and the, point, the point here is very simple. Uh, uh, the system is in crisis because we keep on throwing more into the system and doing the same thing again and again and again. And what we need to do is educate our healthcare practitioners that they need to be responsible for the outcomes, not for the process, but the outcomes. And that's what has made the center a different beast altogether. So how do we do that? Very, very simple. Uh, we are opportunistic, just like HIV. Uh, we, uh, we identify high impact and management strategies that are able to decrease morbidity, mortality, and transmission for high impact diseases. Uh, we focus on priority populations that we know they, they need our help. And we characterize those populations that are affected, and we characterize the barriers that are inhibiting them from have optimal access to those services. 
we don't want to invent the new park. There, is, there are many hearts out there that have been underutilized. We need to fix those before we can invent the new ones. And so we're doing a bit of both, but the focus is on treatment prevention, which I view as the magnet that brings the optimal treatment, and by treatment, I mean management, anything from education to vaccines to whatever you want, uh, together with the populations that need to be uh, 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 helped or access those services. And we, when you bring those two things together with the magic sauce, that is the political will that, that the minister provides, then bingo, everything works. Look at this, hepatitis C. Um, uh, we are delighted and we thank the minister for redoubling his commitment to support our hepatitis C treatment prevention campaign because with that, uh, we can change this casio paper that looks not so good to something that is going to look like or like that. And I commit that with the appropriate support and collaboration from our partners, including BCCDC, we, in, within five years, we will have that, but we need to get on with it right away. And Kate is doing a terrific job at helping doing that. Can we do that for anything else? Of course. The minister recently announced that we're going to start today offering doxycycline for, for prophylaxis of bacterial sexually transmitted infections uh, to people who are on PrEP or high-risk individuals who are on antiretroviral therapy. Why? Because we're in the midst of a sexually transmitted infection epidemic. And yes, until recently, we didn't have anything that we could offer these people, but now we have. And so it's time to stop thinking about it and start doing it. Uh, these are the results of the New England Journal of Medicine paper that basically show that the, the, there could be an overall two-third decrease in all bacterial sexual transmitted infections using doxycycline uh, as a preventive strategy in this setting. Today, we're the first province in the country that will offer these to eligible individuals for free and no questions asked. Thank you. Please. And what about your opinion disorder? And you're going to say, well, 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 now you're going a little bit uh, beyond anything we ever thought. Because until now, I've been focused on infectious diseases. And it's easy to understand how by treating a person who is carrying a, a bug, a virus or a bacteria or whatever, uh, uh, you can suppress transmission. What about social contagion? If you think about it, a whole lot of the highest burden diseases that we confront today, from type 2 diabetes, uh, to uh, aterosclerosis, to a whole bunch of other things are related to, uh, to uh, social uh, behavioral causation. My dad used to tell you, uh, you know, COPD is as infectious as anything else. And I said, uh, what are you talking about? Well, because if I smoke, you smoke. And, and, and then my father smoked, my son smoked, my, my sister smoked, and that's the cause of COPD 90% of the time. Uh, so if we identify a mechanistic way of uh, uh, transmission that that is applicable uh, when 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 you address the disease from that perspective, you get exactly the same results. So we are currently committed to deploy this kind of effort in the downtown east side as an incubator, if you want, uh, because that's what the, all of these diseases converge and it allows us to demonstrate that a patient-centered approach in an environment that was previously thought to be intractable actually. That leads to an outcome that is surprising. And surprise, surprise, starting in 2017, uh, we established a Hope to Health uh, Center. We activated it in 2019, uh, uh, 2019, correct, with the support of his who? Yes, Tico? <laughs> Minister. Exactly. <laughs> with Minister, <laughs> the Minister takes support, we, we implemented this program, and we're seeing incredible success. Kudos to uh, Rolando Barrios, who has been a, a lead in this effort. David Hall is here as well, and a number of others. Uh, this has been terrific. Basically, uh, we have a similar situation with an HIV, people who are not in care, to people who are engaged in care, to people who are optimally engaged in care. Uh, we bring services, uh, primary care, uh, safe and supply, supervised consumption, but we, we, we approach this in a holistic uh, patient center basis, uh, and we allow people to set their own agendas as to what they want to achieve at the same time that we engage them in a conversation uh, as to what else we can offer you, and when you die, or yeah, I know it, uh, when you do that, you get 
85% rotation in the downtown facade in years of our minority engagement there in all our programs. That's all you need to know. Don't worry. It's fine. Uh, if you could give me the last, nice, that would be nice. Uh, and, and so the bottom line is this. Uh, if we can apply these kind of thinking to everything that we do, we are going to get the same kind of success. Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you, Minister. And uh, uh, I take this opportunity to thank all of you, my colleagues, uh, for the terrific work that you've done over the last four decades uh, to achieve something that has not been achieved anywhere else here in BC, which has been replicated, at least attempted to be replicated, in the rest of the country and in the rest of the world. Thank you.